Plato's Apology is one of the most famous pieces in the history of not just philosophy, but world literature in general. Depicting the trial of Socrates, it is not actually him apologizing, but instead it is his defense against the charges. That's what the Greek word apologia means, after all. If you've ever heard of a Christian apologist or something like that and been confused, now you know. It means someone who defends something, not apologize for it. Since Plato was actually present at the trial, it paints the best picture of the character of Socrates, giving us an idea of why he has become so beloved throughout history. I have to say, I had the biggest grin on my face throughout writing this episode as I reread the classic speeches of Socrates that made him so famous. I already know it's going to be a joy going through these dialogues, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. It's hard not to appreciate the spirit and wit of Socrates, and though it is not a word-for-word -word transcription of his speeches, we know we can rely on it because of how much of it agrees with Xenophon's account of the trial, also known as the Apology. We're going to dig into Plato's Apology and see why someone like Socrates would be tried and executed over seemingly just asking questions. Hey, I'm Matt, you're watching Nothing New, and today we're beginning our series on the trial of Socrates with one of the most important dialogues Plato wrote about Socrates' final days, the Apology. It's not really a dialogue like the other early works, but of course, this was the trial of a lifetime. You can see there's a good reason why it stands out among the dialogues. We're going to see why Socrates was accused of things that seem silly to us today, such as corrupting the youth and not believing in the city gods, and examine Socrates' defense and account of why he had to be the gadfly of Athens, even if it would result in death. When Socrates proposes that he should be rewarded instead of punished for his actions, and then accepts the sentence of death without fear, he ensured that he would be remembered forever for his moral fiber and dedication to philosophy. That's just some of what we're exploring today. But first, interested in Greek philosophy? Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell. We have new videos coming out every week. Anyways, let's get into it. The dialogue begins with Socrates appealing to the jury, which would have been selected randomly from the citizens of Athens. Remember that democratic Athens had a very unique justice system. Anyone could bring a charge on anyone else, and it was up to the accuser and defender to support and defend themselves. It certainly would have been a jury of your peers, maybe even your neighbors, leading some to say that democracy and the people of Athens itself killed Socrates. But anyways, Socrates begins his defense, saying, I do not know, men of Athens, how my accusers affected you. As for me, I was almost carried away in spite of myself, so persuasively did they speak. And yet, hardly anything of what they said is true. Of the many lies they told, one in particular surprised me, namely that you should be careful not to be deceived by an accomplished speaker like me, that they were not ashamed to be immediately proved wrong by the facts, when I show myself not to be an accomplished speaker at all. That, I thought, was most shameless on their part. Unless, indeed, they call an accomplished speaker the man who speaks the truth. If they mean that, I would agree that I am an orator, but not after their manner. For indeed, as I say, practically nothing they said was true. From me, you will hear the whole truth, though not by Zeus, gentlemen, expressed in embroidered and stylized phrases like theirs, but things spoken at random and expressed in the first words that come to mind. For I put my trust in the justice of what I say, and let none of you expect anything else. It would not be fitting at my age, as it might be for a young man, to toy with words when I appear before you. By the time of Socrates' trial, he was already something of a local celebrity, and if he were living today, he would have said that he had already been tried in the court of public opinion, since, as he argues, most were only aware of him because of Aristophanes' satire, The Clouds, where Socrates serves as a caricature of all pre-Socratic philosophy. There have been many who have accused me to you for many years now, and none of their accusations are true. They got hold of most of you from childhood, persuaded you and accused me quite falsely, saying that there is a man called Socrates, a wise man, a student of all things in the sky and below the earth, who makes the worse argument the stronger. Those who spread that rumor, gentlemen, are my dangerous accusers, for their hearers believe that those who study these things do not even believe in the gods. Moreover, these accusers are numerous and have been at it a long time. Also, they spoke to you at an age when you would most readily believe them, some of you being children and adolescents, and they won their case by default, as there was no defense. 
What is most absurd in all of this is that one cannot even know or mention their names, unless one of them is a writer of comedies. Socrates compares defending himself from these rumors and those who spread them to fighting shadows. Socrates says that these false claims about him were the original accusations against him, and having addressed them, he moves on to the new accusations. Socrates tells us the reason why he set out to question the supposedly wise men of Athens, who quickly grew annoyed with him. It seems Socrates' philosophical quest began when a friend of his traveled to the Oracle of Delphi to ask one simple question. Were there any Greeks wiser than Socrates? The Oracle answered, No. This is how Socrates reacted. When I heard of this reply, I asked myself, Whatever does the god mean? What is his riddle? I am very conscious that I am not wise at all. What then does he mean by saying that I am the wisest? For surely he does not lie. It is not legitimate for him to do so. For a long time I was at a loss as to his meaning. Then I very reluctantly turned to some such investigation as this. I went to one of those reputed wise, thinking that there, if anywhere, I could refute the oracle and say to it, This man is wiser than I, but you said I was. Then when I examined this man, there is no need for me to tell you his name, he was one of our public men. My experience was something like this. I thought that he appeared wise to many people, and especially to himself, but he was not. As a result, he came to dislike me, and so did many of the bystanders. So I withdrew and thought to myself, I am wiser than this man. It is likely that neither of us knows anything worthwhile, but he thinks he knows something when he does not, whereas when I do not know, neither do I think I know. So I am likely to be wiser than he is to this small extent, that I do not think I know what I do not know. After this, I approached another man, one of those thought to be wiser than he, and I thought the same thing, and so I came to be disliked both by him and by many others. After that, I proceeded systematically. I realized to my sorrow and alarm that I was getting unpopular, but I thought that I must attach the greatest importance to the god's oracle, so I must go to all those who had any reputation for knowledge to examine its meaning, and by the dog, men of Athens, for I must tell you the truth. I experienced something like this. In my investigation in the service of the god, I found that those who had the highest reputation were nearly the most deficient, while those who were thought to be inferior were more knowledgeable. After the politicians, Socrates questioned the poets. After the poets, he questioned the tragedians. After the tragedians, he questioned the craftsmen. He found that the bystanders could explain the poems better than their authors could, and that because of their talent, which he thought came from divine inspiration, they were overconfident in their wisdom. They were no better than the politicians, and the craftsmen were no better than the poets. Because of their success in their trade, they started to think they were wise in all sorts of ways in which they really weren't, as we'll see in later dialogues. Eventually he comes to see that the oracle was correct after all, interpreting their answer to mean that human wisdom was relatively worthless, and his wisdom came in understanding this. Socrates goes on to explain why he has gained a following of young men, saying that they take pleasure in hearing people question. They themselves often imitate me and try to question others. I think they find an abundance of men who believe they have some knowledge, but know little or nothing. The result is that those whom they question are angry, not with themselves, but with me. They say, that man Socrates is a pestilential fellow who corrupts the young. If one asks them what he does and what he teaches to corrupt them, they are silent, as they do not know, but as not to appear at a loss, they mention those accusations that are available against all philosophers, about things in the sky and things below the earth, about not believing in the gods, and making the worse the stronger argument. They would not want to tell the truth, I'm sure, that they have been proved to lay claim to knowledge when they know nothing. These people are ambitious, violent, and numerous. They are continually and convincingly talking about me. They have been filling your ears for a long time with vehement slanders against me. Socrates soon begins to dismantle one of his accusers' arguments, lampooning the idea that all of the Athenians seem to benefit the youth except for Socrates, who is the sole person who corrupts them. Why would he deliberately hurt the very city he lives in by corrupting the young? He questions his accuser, saying, Are you so much wiser at your age than I am at mine that you understand that wicked people always do some harm to their closest neighbors while good people do them good? But I have reached such a pitch of ignorance that I do not realize this? Namely that if I make one of my associates wicked, 
I run the risk of being harmed by him, so that I do such a great evil deliberately, as you say? I do not believe you, Miletus, and I do not think anyone else will. Either I do not corrupt the young, or if I do, it is unwillingly, and you are lying in either case." He concludes that Miletus is not actually concerned with what he says about Socrates corrupting the youth, and so he moves on to the main point for which he was on trial, atheism. He quickly dismantles this accusation as well, showing how they falsely attribute the teachings of the pre-Socratic philosophers to him. He asks Miletus, do I not believe, as other men do, that the sun and the moon are gods? Miletus responds, No, by Zeus, gentlemen of the jury, for he says that the sun is stone and the moon earth. My dear Miletus, do you think you are prosecuting Anaxagoras? Are you so contemptuous of these men and think them so ignorant of letters as not to know that the books of Anaxagoras are full of those theories? And further, that the young men learn from me what they can buy from time to time for a drachma at most in the bookshops, and ridicule Socrates if he pretends that these theories are his own, especially as they are so absurd? Is that, by Zeus, what you think of me, Miletus, that I do not believe that there are any gods? That is what I say, that you do not believe in the gods at all. In our video on the pluralists, we talked about how Anaxagoras taught that the sun was not a divinity, but instead a fiery stone. You should check that out if you haven't seen it yet. Spoiler alert, Anaxagoras was also in prison for his philosophy and had to be saved by Pericles. My hope is that by covering the pre-Socratics in full depth in my other videos, you'll have a lot more context and understanding as we begin to see their ideas pop up in Plato's dialogues. Anyways, Socrates points out the contradiction that they say he's an atheist while also acknowledging that he believes in spirits. We'll see later that he even says a spirit guides him warning him when he's about to make a mistake. How could he believe in anything spiritual if he was an atheist like they said? Socrates continues his questioning. If I believe in spiritual things, I must quite inevitably believe in spirits. Is that not so? It is indeed. I shall assume that you agree, as you do not answer. Do we not believe spirits to be either gods or the children of gods? Yes or no? Of course. Then since I do believe in spirits, as you admit, if spirits are gods, this is what I mean when I say you speak in riddles and in jest, as you state that I do not believe in gods, and then again that I do, since I believe in spirits. What man would believe children of the gods to exist, but not gods? We then get a powerful defense of why Socrates has been acting in such a way, not caring if his lifestyle would lead to the danger of death which it was now presently in. Since we have no idea what actually happens after death, it's very pretentious of us to judge it as some terrible thing. Those who live their lives in fear of death do so because of ignorance, according to Socrates. You are wrong, sir, if you think that a man who is any good at all should take into account the risk of life or death. He should only consider whether in doing anything he is doing right or wrong, whether he is acting like a good or a bad man. According to your view, all the heroes who died at Troy were inferior people, especially the son of Thetis, who was so contemptuous of danger compared with disgrace. He despised death and danger and was much more afraid to live a coward who did not avenge his friends. Let me die at once, he said, when once I have given the wrongdoer his deserts, rather than remain here a laughing stock by the curved ships, a burden upon the earth. Do you think he gave thought to death and danger? This is the truth of the matter, men of Athens. Wherever a man has taken a position he believes to be best, or has been placed by his commander, there he must, I think, remain and face danger without a thought for death or anything else, rather than disgrace. To fear death, gentlemen, is no other than to think oneself wise when one is not, to think one knows what one does not know. No one knows whether death may not be the greatest blessings for a man, yet men fear it as if they knew that it is the greatest of evils. It is perhaps on this point and in this respect, gentlemen, that I differ from the majority of men, and if I were to claim that I am wiser than anyone in anything, it would be in this that, as I have no adequate knowledge of things in the underworld, so I do not think I have. Socrates tells the jury that if he were acquitted on condition that he gave up the practice of philosophy, he would never accept it. He says he would rather obey the gods than men, and as long as he draws breath and is able, he will continue to ask his fellow Athenians why they care so much about wealth, reputation, and honor, while not giving a thought to wisdom, truth, or the state of their soul. 
He gets to a point where he says that he is no longer making a defense for himself, but for those who would unjustly execute an innocent man, even if they kill him, they cannot harm him. And he says that his accusers will suffer far more harm by acting so immorally. Socrates believes that, in fact, the gods themselves placed him in the city to rouse the people from their sleep, and this is how he puts it. I was attached to the city by the god, though it seems a ridiculous thing to say, as upon a great and noble horse which was somewhat sluggish because of its size and needed to be stirred up by a kind of gadfly. It is to fulfill some such function that I believe the god has placed me in the city. I never cease to rouse each and every one of you, to persuade and reproach you all day long and everywhere I find myself in your company. Another such man will not easily come to be among you, gentlemen, and if you believe me, you will spare me. We then reach one of the most intriguing passages, where Socrates describes the divine sign that he heard as a voice ever since he was a child. I have a divine or spiritual sign which Miletus has ridiculed in his deposition. This began when I was a child. It is a voice, and whenever it speaks, it turns me away from something I am about to do, but it never encourages me to do anything. This is what has prevented me from taking part in public affairs, and I think it was quite right to prevent me. Be sure, men of Athens, that if I had long ago attempted to take part in politics, I should have died long ago, and benefited neither you nor myself. Do not be angry with me for speaking the truth. No man will survive who genuinely opposes you or any other crowd and prevents the occurrence of many unjust and illegal happenings in the city. A man who really fights for justice must lead a private, not a public life, if he is to survive for even a short time. Socrates begins to wrap up his defense, saying that since he never charged for a conversation or teaching like the sophists did, he was nobody's teacher and therefore not responsible for the good or bad conduct of those who happened to be listening when he was debating people in public. He says he will not use emotional tricks like crying and begging or seek sympathy by bringing the sons he will leave behind to court. He will only rely on good arguments and truth to win his case. But he does not win. The verdict is guilty by a narrow margin, and Miletus asks for the penalty of death. With such high stakes, Athenian law required that both the prosecutor and the defendant propose the penalty for the charges. The punishment Socrates proposes is probably the funniest part of this whole speech. What counter-assessment should I propose to you, men of Athens? Clearly it should be a penalty I deserve, and what do I deserve to suffer or to pay because I have deliberately not led a quiet life, but have neglected what occupies most people? Wealth, household affairs, the position of general or public orator or the other offices, the political clubs and factions that exist in the city. I thought myself too honest to survive if I occupied myself with those things. I did not follow that path that would have made me of no use either to you or to myself. But I went to each of you privately and conferred upon him what I say is the greatest benefit, by trying to persuade him not to care for any of his belongings before caring that he himself should be as good and as wise as possible, not to care for the city's possessions more than for the city itself, and to care for other things in the same way. What do I deserve for being such a man? Some good men of Athens, if I must truly make an assessment according to my deserts, and something suitable. What is suitable for a poor benefactor who needs leisure to exhort you? Nothing is more suitable, gentlemen, than for such a man to be fed in the Pritaneum much more suitable for him than for any one of you who has won a victory at Olympia with a pair or a team of horses. The Olympian victor makes you think yourself happy. I make you be happy. Besides, he does not need food, but I do. So if I must make a just assessment of what I deserve, I assess it as this. Free meals in the Pritaneum. Of course, this does not work. And Socrates is finally sentenced to death. His closing remarks speak for themselves. It is for the sake of a short time, men of Athens, that you will acquire the reputation and the guilt in the eyes of those who want to denigrate the city of having killed Socrates, a wise man. For they who want to revile you will say that I am wise even if I am not. If you had waited but a little while, this would have happened on its own accord. You see my age, that I am already advanced in years and close to death. I am saying this not to all of you, but to those who condemn me to death. And to these same ones I say, Perhaps you think that I was convicted for lack of such words as might have convinced you, if I thought I should say or do all I could to avoid my sentence. Far from it. 
I was convicted because I lacked not words, but boldness and shamelessness, and the willingness to say to you what you would most gladly have heard from me. Lamentations and tears and my saying and doing many things that I say are unworthy of me, but that you are accustomed to hear from others. I did not think then that the danger I ran should make me do anything mean, nor do I now regret the nature of my defense. I would much rather die after this kind of defense than live after making the other kind. Neither I nor any other man should, on trial or in war, contrive to avoid death at any cost. Indeed, it is often obvious in battle that one could escape death by throwing away one's weapons and by turning to supplicate one's pursuers. And there are many ways to avoid death in every kind of danger if one will venture to do or say anything to avoid it. It is not difficult to avoid death, gentlemen. It is much more difficult to avoid wickedness, for it runs faster than death. Slow and elderly as I am, I have been caught by the slower pursuer, whereas my accusers, being clever and sharp, have been caught by the quicker, wickedness. I leave you now, condemned to death by you, but they are condemned by truth to wickedness and injustice. So I maintain my assessment, and they maintain theirs. This perhaps had to happen, and I think it is as it should be. Socrates continues by essentially saying that he will come back with a vengeance, and that though they were trying to avoid accounting for themselves by silencing his questions, now they will not just be dealing with Socrates' questions, but the questions of all who will be inspired by his death. He tells them that you are wrong if you believe that by killing people you will prevent anyone from reproaching you for not living in the right way. To escape such tests is neither possible nor good, but it is best and easiest not to discredit others but to prepare oneself to be as good as possible. He notes how, while his divine sign had held him back from speaking at times in the past, not once during the entire process of this trial did it oppose him. This is why he was so serene about everything, saying that it was as it should be. He says he believes the reason for this is that death may be a good thing. There is good hope that death is a blessing, for it is one of two things, either the dead are nothing and have no perception of anything, or it is, as we are told, a change and a relocating for the soul from here to another place. If it is complete lack of perception, like a dreamless sleep, then death would be a great advantage. For I think that if one had to pick out that night during which a man slept soundly and did not dream, put beside it the other nights and days of his life, and then see how many days and nights had been better and more pleasant than that night, not only a private person, but the great king would find them easy to count compared with the other days and nights. I know this is confusing. What he's saying is that few days or nights in your life are better than the nights where you sleep soundly and don't dream. If death is like this, I say it is an advantage. For all eternity would then seem to be no more than a single night. If on the other hand, death is a change from here to another place, and what we are told is true, and all who have died are there, what greater blessing could there be, gentlemen of the jury? He then goes on to list all the legendary kings, heroes, and poets who he'd get to spend the afterlife with. And then he says my absolute favorite line in this whole dialogue. I just think it's so sweet and admirable that he says that if there is a life after death, he would spend it doing the same thing he's always done. Socrates says, I could spend my time testing and examining people there, as I do here, as to who among them is wise and who thinks he is but is not. What would one not give, gentlemen of the jury, for the opportunity to examine the man who led the great expedition against Troy, or Odysseus, or Sisyphus, and innumerable other men and women one could mention? It would be an extraordinary happiness to talk with them, to keep company with them and examine them. In any case, they would certainly not put one to death for doing so. And so, Socrates reminds us to be in good hope regarding death, and to keep one truth in mind that a good man cannot be harmed either in life or in death, and that his affairs are not neglected by the gods. Socrates wasn't angry at all, and didn't blame them. He only asks that, when his sons grow up, if they seem to care for money or anything else more than they care about virtue, to reproach them as I reproach you. So that's the trial of Socrates, as told by Plato's Apology. What a guy, what a dialogue. I mean, it's not really a dialogue like the others, as we'll see, but still, we get a great look into many of the main points of Socrates' philosophy. Though he never says the exact phrase, I know that I know nothing, he still gives us his most famous expression of the sentiment by saying that, when I do not know, neither do I think I know. 
We can clearly see that Socrates wasted no time by trying to save himself, but instead cleared his name and once again used any opportunity he could get to challenge the people around him to care more for their souls than for material things. Anyways, that's all for today. We'll be continuing to cover the trial of Socrates with the four dialogues, Euthyphro, Credo, Mino, and the Phaedo. So keep an eye out for all of those. Don't forget to like the video if you learned something new. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And definitely let me know what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.